M S W Media. Thanks to Athletic Greens for supporting the Daily Beans. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. If you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash dailybeans. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Thursday, April 13th, 2023. A new round of subpoenas goes out from Jack Smith's office. A judge has imposed sanctions on Fox News for withholding evidence. An appellate court rules Pete Navarro still has to turn over the documents he's been withholding. Representative Justin Pearson has been reinstated in the Tennessee House. Donald Trump has sued Michael Cohen for half a billion dollars. And Donald is trying to delay the E. Jean Carroll trial set to begin April 25th. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everyone. First of all, I just want to say happy birthday to Dana Goldberg. She's not here, but she can hear me. Happy birthday. I miss you, my friend. Uh, I know she's celebrating wherever she is. Uh, Later in the show today, I'll be talking with Michelle Eisen about Starbucks union busting. And local officials have unanimously voted on Wednesday to send Justin Pearson back to the Tennessee State House. Now, I say unanimously kind of in air quotes because it was a seven to nothing vote because the four Republicans were too cowardly to even show up to cast their vote either way. Another bad look for what's been going on over in Tennessee. And uh, now they are back. They are going to be advocating for common sense gun laws. Governor Bill Lee now looks like he is interested in signing some additional gun laws. I mean, I guess I guess that's a good thing. Um, It shouldn't have to take what it took or what it's taking. But um, we should see some changes there very soon. And, uh, you know, hey, I, just like Donald Trump put himself under a microscope when he ran for president, the the Tennessee GOP did the same thing. The the nation and the world are watching them now. They it's they are not going to be able to get away with this for much longer. And also in Arizona, the Arizona House expelled one of its Republican members for having a conspiracy theorist come in and say that you know people were accepting bribes, so she's gone. So that's good. That's a a correct move. And I hope this really draws a lot of attention, not just to the Tennessee State House, but to all state and local legislatures, state houses, assemblies and senates and city councils, for for that matter. This is all where the I guess where the, you know, the real gritty grassroots government takes place. We need to shed a light on it when it's not doing what it's designed to do. All right. We have a lot of news to get to, uh, including, and we'll go over this on Sunday on the the episode of Jack, several more subpoenas went out about looking at more details about Trump PAC spending, right? Remember how Andy and I talked about, hey, they're looking at fraud now, wire fraud, money laundering. Back in December when CNN reported that several subpoenas had gone out looking at the election defense fund that doesn't even exist and uh, the Trump PAC. And then later on in January, we got reporting that all four PACs were being uh, had questions raised about them and subpoenas went out. Well, another round of subpoenas went out early March to look at some of that information. And we'll cover that along with some other news about how it seems the documents case might be finally coming to a conclusion least with the obstruction piece. So lots of stuff to go over on the Jack podcast this weekend. All right, everybody. Again, we have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. First up from Robertson and Peters at the New York Times. The judge overseeing the Dominion Voting Systems lawsuit against Fox News said on Wednesday that he was imposing sanctions, a sanction on the network, Fox, and would very likely start an investigation into whether Fox's legal team had deliberately withheld key evidence, scolding the lawyers for not being straightforward with him. This is a huge last minute bombshell twist in this case. It was already going downhill for Fox. We knew that 
you know, that uh, Dominion got summary judgment on falsity so that the prosecution doesn't even have to prove that they were lies. Uh, we learned that some key evidence from motions in limine was excluded, like Fox can't use certain defenses, not key evidence, but key defenses for Fox aren't going to be able to be used, including their defense that, well, even though they were lies, they were newsworthy lies. They aren't going to be able to argue that either. It's going to be a very difficult case for Fox News and the parent company, Fox Corporation. Uh, But, you know, jury selection starts here tomorrow. And all of a sudden, right before the trial, we get this information about key evidence being withheld. It first came out last night in the, in the Daily Beast. And then uh, this is the Times reporting today. This rebuke from the judge came after lawyers for Dominion, which is suing for defamation, revealed a number of instances in which Fox's lawyers had not turned over evidence in a timely manner. That evidence included recordings of the Fox News host Bartiromo talking with former President Trump lawyers Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani, which Dominion said had been turned over only a week ago. In imposing a sanction on Fox, Judge Davis of the Delaware Superior Court, this is where this is happening, is in Delaware, ruled that if Dominion had to do additional depositions or redo any already done, that Fox will do everything they can to make that person available and it's going to have to be on Fox's dime. All of this Fox will have to pay for. He also said he would likely appoint a special master to investigate Fox's handling of discovery of documents and a question of whether Fox had inappropriately withheld details about Rupert Murdoch's role as a corporate officer of Fox News. That would be damning. Again, the trial is scheduled to begin Monday, jury selection starting today, Thursday. It's not immediately clear that Dominion would avail itself of the judge's ruling that its lawyers could conduct additional depositions. The trial is about to start. The judge told Fox's lawyers to retain all internal communications between themselves relating to the officer issue from the time of March 20th. Now, he uh, said he would weigh whether any additional sanctions should be put on Fox based on anything that this potential investigation uncovers. He said he was very concerned that there had been misrepresentations to the court. That is very serious. And that's what Judge Davis said. This is very serious. That's a quote. We keep on learning, he said, about more relevant information from individuals other than Fox. And to be honest, we don't really know what to do about that. But that is the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, She pointed to one email that had recently been handed over between Bartiromo and Powell on November 7th, 2020. In the email, Ms. Powell was forwarding evidence to Bartiromo that Dominion said was proof that Fox had acted recklessly. An email from a woman Mrs. Powell relied on as a source who exhibits signs of delusion, claiming, for instance, she was aware of voter fraud because she had special powers, including the ability to time travel and talk to the wind. Quote, I just spoke to Eric and told him you gave me very important information, said Bartiromo to Ms. Powell, most likely referring to Eric Trump. Now, Ms. Brooke also played two recordings for the court of pre-interviews. Ms. Brooke is one of the lawyers for Abby Grossman, I believe. This is a preliminary conversation before an on-air interview done by Ms. Bartiromo that she said were received only after they were revealed in legal complaints filed by Abby Grossberg, a former Fox News producer who is suing the network. Okay, so I'm mistaken. I think it's a a lawyer for Dominion. So in one of the recordings, one of the Abby Grossman recordings, and this was on November 8th, 2020, the day after the election was declared for Biden, Bartiromo asks Giuliani about the Dominion software. He says it's being analyzed right now. And when she asks about a false connection to Nancy Pelosi, Giuliani says, yeah, I've read that. I can't prove that yet. Now, Justin Nelson, another lawyer for Dominion, asked Judge Davis to deconsolidate the case and focus solely on Fox News at the trial, excluding the Fox Corporation, the parent company, because Fox's lawyers had only recently disclosed that Murdoch, the executive chairman of Fox Corp was also the executive chair of Fox News, a role that pointed to more responsibility for its broadcasts. They just learned that. So Dominion wanted to pull apart the cases against the, because the cases were consolidated against Fox News and Fox Corp. Mr. Nelson said, had that information been given earlier, the scope of the discovery of documents would have been much larger and relevant documents could still be missing. Quote, we have been litigating based upon this false premise that Rupert Murdoch was not an officer at Fox News. 
Now, Judge Davis declined to deconsolidate the case, but expressed concern that Fox's legal team had not been forthcoming with the information, despite being asked multiple times whether or not Mr. Murdoch was a corporate officer for Fox News. Quote, I need people to tell me the truth. And by the way, omission is a lie. That's what the judge said. He also admonished Fox's lawyers, saying he'd previously asked for clarity on who had corporate responsibilities at Fox News, but had not heard back. Quote, what do I do with attorneys that aren't straightforward with me? So this is big. This is a big twist. And we'll see where all this heads. But appointing a special master, withholding key evidence, particularly recordings of of the lies. My God. All right. Next up from Kyle Cheney at Politico. A federal appeals court on Wednesday rejected a bid from Peter Navarro to put a stay on the fact that he has to hand over hundreds of government records, despite a judge's order to return them promptly to the National Archives. This has been going on for a while. Quote, there's no public interest in Navarro's retention of the records, and Congress has recognized that the public has an interest in the nation's possession and retention of the presidential records. That's what the three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals concluded in a unanimous two-page order. The Justice Department sued Navarro last year, seeking to reclaim hundreds of records contained in Navarro's personal Proton Mail account that the government said should have been returned to the National Archives after the Trump administration came to an end in January 2021. Now, Proton Mail is a Swiss company, so they can't just swoop in and get them without burning a bridge that you wouldn't, that Navarro's not worth burning that bridge. You know what I mean? So they've just been trying to claw him back from Navarro. And they won several times, and he keeps not handing them over. Navarro acknowledged that at least 200 to 250 records in his possession belong to the government, but he contended no mechanism exists to enforce that requirement, and in doing so might violate his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. He feels that handing over these presidential records would incriminate him for violating the presidential records law. Last month, District Court Judge Colleen Culler Cottley rejected that claim, ordering Navarro to promptly return the records he had identified, that Navarro had identified, that is, as belonging to the government. But Navarro appealed that decision, rejecting the notion that the Justice Department had any legitimate mechanism to force him to return the records. And he urged the court to stay Culler Cottley's ruling while his appeal was pending. But the appeals court, which included Judges Patricia Millett and Robert Wilkins, both Obama appointees and Judge Naomi Rao, Rao, a notorious a-hole Donald Trump appointee, unanimously rejected Navarro's stay request. Within minutes, Collar Cottley put the squeeze on Navarro, ordering him to turn over the 250 records on or before Friday, tomorrow. She also ordered him to perform additional searches or for presidential records that might be in his possession by May 8th, with further proceedings scheduled for later that month. He has, to, he has to keep looking. And also from Cheney, Donald Trump argued late Tuesday that his historic indictment by a Manhattan grand jury requires a delay in another legal matter he faces, which is the defamation suit brought by E. Jean, e. Jean Carroll, who says Trump defamed her when he denied and derided her claim that he raped her decades ago. The former president is slated to defend against those allegations on the starting in a civil trial April 25th. But Joey Tacos, that's Trump lawyer Joe Tacopina, is urging Judge Kaplan to postpone it for a month, contending the surge in media coverage of Trump's indictment has tainted potential jurors in the civil case. Can you imagine just a regular old defendant who commits a crime and then commits another crime being able to say, hey, we need a cooling off period because I'm I crimed over here and that could taint the jury over here. Fuck no. <laughs> and and Trump has tried multiple times to delay this trial. He even offered after discovery closed to give a DNA sample, knowing that it would be rejected because discovery had been closed. He was also trying to play the courts against each other, trying to get his trial scheduled for the same time so that one of them would have to be delayed. And that didn't have to do with the E. Jean Carroll case, but it was E. Jean Carroll's lawyer who notified the judge saying, hey, they're trying to play you. Quote, holding the trial in this case A mere three weeks after these historic events will guarantee that many, if not most, prospective jurors will have the criminal allegations top of mind when judging President Trump against Ms. Carroll's allegations. Takapina argued in a late night filing that, that they should delay this, contending 
that the intensity of media coverage was remarkable for its volume and incitement of animus toward President Trump among potential jurors. Now, this actually isn't too bad of an argument, right? Like, come on, he was on TV. They followed his plane. CNN was in a boat on the Hudson watching him land in New York. It was everywhere. It was a media circus. Come on. Can we give everybody a month to cool out? Now, Takapina acknowledged that Trump draws blanket media coverage at nearly all times. But he said Google searches indicated a particularly intense surge of coverage of the charges brought by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg earlier in the month. Those charges include claims that Trump falsified business records to conceal hush money payments to a porn star to cover up an affair. Because those charges relate to Carol's claims of sexual misconduct, Takapina said, there's a particularly acute risk that jurors in the civil trial will conflate the issues. Now, Carroll responded to Trump's effort Wednesday afternoon, contending that Trump himself is responsible for driving the media interest and coverage of his legal troubles. Quote, if anything, it is somewhat perverse for Trump to seek continuance in these proceedings based on the recent indictment when so much of the publicity he complains about has been driven by his own incendiary statements. That's from Robbie Kaplan, E. Jean's attorney. They also noted that Trump has turned his indictment into a bid for fundraising and selling campaign merchandise. And he appeared on Fox News just hours before, seeking a delay in the civil trial and discussed his pending indictment. Quote, not surprisingly, Trump's mounting legal difficulties have given rise to substantial press coverage and will continue to do so. He is not only a former president, but also a declared candidate in the next presidential election. As a result, each passing week will offer Trump yet another straw to grasp at in his campaign to avoid standing trial for sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll. Now, it, here's the thing. If you put this off a month to, to, to May 25th, from April 25th, what else might happen by May 25th to cause another media uproar? An indictment in the documents case, an indictment for racketeering in Georgia, an indictment on defrauding donors, wire fraud by Trump PACs. I, I mean, find me a month this year that Donald isn't in danger of being indicted during. <laughs> uh, it's, it's only going to get bigger. All right. From Shabbat and Barnes at NBC, Donald Trump filed a lawsuit in federal court Wednesday because he's trying to keep a low profile against his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, who has emerged as a key witness in the criminal case against the former president, seeking more than half a billion dollars in damages for alleged breaches of fiduciary duty, unjust enrichment, uh, okay, conversion and breaches of contract. Okay. Um, <laughs> Time to take a swim in Lake U, uh, Mr. Trump. The complaint accuses Cohen of violating his attorney-client relationship with Trump by publicly disclosing information about the former president and the spreading falsehoods about Trump, likely to be embarrassing or detrimental, and partook in other misconduct in violation of New York rules of professional conduct. Okay. Dude went to prison. The former president has, quote, suffered vast reputational harm as a direct result of Michael Cohen, not of Trump's own fucking behavior. Michael, Co my reputational harm comes from what Michael Cohen did. That's Trump's lawyer, Alejandro Brito. This is a new one I haven't heard of. And he wrote that in a complaint filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. Huh, judge shopping much? Trump's attorney said Cohen did those things with malicious intent and to wholly self-serving ends. Cohen committed the breaches, quote, by disparaging Trump through myriad public statements, including the publication of two books, a podcast series and innumerable mainstream media appearances. According to the complaint, quote, defendant has engaged in such wrongful conduct over a period of time and despite being demanded in writing to cease and desist such unacceptable actions, has instead in recent months increased the frequency and hostility of the illicit acts toward the plaintiff. Cohen's attorney, Lanny Davis, responded to the lawsuit by just laughing for 20 minutes. No, he said uh, Trump appears once again to be using and abusing the judicial system as a form of harassment and intimidation. This is 
Cohen is a witness in an upcoming trial against him and you're suing him. That's, wow. Trump wants, quote, compensatory, incidental, and punitive damages in the amount that would be determined at trial and would substantially exceed half a billion dollars, unquote. He also wants any profits or compensation Cohen receives from all of his books, podcasts, and other products. (laughs) Yeah, this lawsuit, um, in case you're wondering where my beans are, is going nowhere. It'll probably be withdrawn before sanctions, before they're hit with sanctions. Brito, where this Alejandro Brito guy, hey, you know, maybe talk to Alina Haba and see where you're at with, uh, you know, having to pay huge sanctions fines. <laughs> Can't believe Haba is still his attorney. Can't believe Corcoran is still his attorney. Christina Bob got out when she could. I t- last year when I said, look, Bob, when I f- we found out Christina Bob and Corcoran signed that letter that all the documents, classified documents have been handed over. I'm like, both y'all need to get the fuck off his legal team and lawyer up. And Bob did. Corcoran didn't. Now he's been forced to testify under the crime fraud exception in the documents case and hand over all of his handwritten notes and audio transcripts and invoices. Ooh. All right, everybody, we'll talk about that documents case in detail and the wire fraud investigation on this weekend's episode of The Jack Podcast. And uh, I'm going to take a quick break right now. I'll be back with Michelle Eisen. She's incredible barista and advocate for unions rights at Starbucks. And we're going to talk about the CEO's testimony to Congress and how they're union busting and retaliatory. They violated the National Labor Relations Act every which way. The act, also known as the law. So um, you, you definitely want to hear that interview. And then, then we'll hit the good news. So stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I was looking for something tasty that boosted my energy and supported my immune system and my gut health. I take AG1 first thing in the morning, before coffee, before the gym, and it makes me feel unstoppable and ready to take on my day. And I have a great sense of peace knowing that I'm filling all the gaps in my nutrition with AG1, this single delicious scoop of powder. And we want to thank Athletic Greens for their support. Right now, they're offering you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase when you go to athleticgreens.com slash dailybeans. AG1 by Athletic Greens has been a game changer for my daily routine. I highly recommend it to anyone looking for an easy and cost-effective way to get high-quality supplements. My friend suggested it to me a couple years back with great results, and now I am passing it on to you. AG1 is an excellent value. It replaces the need for multiple supplements, including a daily multivitamin, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics for gut health, adaptogens, and a greens blend. I used to have a cabinet full, and now it's just this single delicious scoop. All of these benefits packed into one convenient thing. It's delicious, and it's one of the easiest habits I've ever picked up for my health. You can't beat the simplicity and the effectiveness of AG1 by Athletic Greens. So if you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. That's athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. Check it out. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm happy to be joined today by a barista and an organizer at the first unionized Starbucks store. Please welcome Michelle Eisen. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know. Thank you for being here. I think this is a really important discussion, uh, particularly given the recent testimony to Congress by the Starbucks CEO, which did not go well for him. So uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the impact and retaliation and and things that went on and, and your insights and your thoughts about how that testimony went. But first, could you just give an overview to listeners about the law and, you know, capital T, the law? And how we are supposed to, and I love that we call it the law, like, it, like you know, in Cleveland, Ernest Biner's fumble is called the fumble and John Elway's <laughs> drive is called the drive. Like, it's very hard to be the something. And this is the law, the labor law in the country. It's very, very important. Talk a little bit about some of the protections that are supposed to be in place for workers to unionize. So um, organized labor or or the the idea of organized labor is protected in this country by the National Labor Relations Act, which sounds really big and bad and and sort of all-encompassing. 
reality is that, you know, decades of gutting of this bill have have sort of left this this law, as you call it, weak, incredibly weak. So I'll tell you what it what it should protect against. It should protect against a company's ability to interfere with their workers' right to organize their workplace to form a union. And it should offer these protections in the way that the company can't illegally fire workers if they find out that they're trying to organize a union. It can't technically come in and intimidate or um, surveil its workers if they find out that these workers in this particular place are trying to form a union. It prevents them, essentially, if once a union drive has been announced, what's supposed to happen in that, you know, you often hear the word shop or unit, but in that location is that it's supposed to remain unchanged in any way. So it's supposed to be laboratory conditions, as they call it, so that a fair election can go forward. So an employer can't come in and they can't make promises. They can't promise things like promotions or different rewards if a worker votes no. They also can't come in and threaten a worker. They can't say, oh, well, if you vote for the union, you're no longer going to have health benefits. That's what this law is you know, put in place to protect. And then the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, is the entity that has to oversee that this law is as being carried out by, you know, workers and employers alike. What we've seen in the last 18 months with the Starbucks campaign is a complete and blatant disregard for these laws by the company and, you know, by, I guess, former technically now former CEO Howard Schultz, though he very recently stepped back down after stepping back up <laughs> to um, <laughs> attempt to, to stop this movement. So that that's your sort of brief overview of what that should do. Great. Thank you so much. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the intimidation part, because there seemed to be a lot of that going on. And, you know, I grew up, I saw Norma Ray, and I figured that that kind of union intimidation was a thing of the past, but it is alive and well today. And that is very apparent through these intimidation tactics. Talk a little bit about how, because it's not like Schultz just shows up at a Starbucks store and starts telling people that he's going to fire them, right? This stuff goes down through the ranks, right? In the government, we, we, we say shit rolls downhill, basically. And it goes all the way down to the managers. We saw this happen at Wells Fargo, right, when they were setting up false accounts to get their numbers up. The, the, the CEO told the frontline managers, hey, if you don't have a certain amount of new business by the end of the quarter, uh, new accounts, you're going to not get a bonus or you'll be reprimanded or admonished or some, you know, something will go on your permanent record. And so that kind of wink and a nod, not direct telling them to, you know, violate the law. But that changed the culture in that these managers then started to try and find unique and new ways to skirt, you know, the rules because they were being threatened. Talk a little bit about this sort of hierarchy of uh, oppre union oppression that was that you saw going on at Starbucks. So this campaign started in Buffalo, New York in August of 2021. Within a few days of the announcing of this campaign, the, the sort of public presentation of this campaign, what Starbucks did was ship in hundreds of out-of-town managers and upper-level corporate to Buffalo. And they did this for a couple of reasons. One was they needed a narrative. They needed to explain to the workers in Buffalo, and they needed to explain to the rest of the country and the rest of the world why all of a sudden this supposedly really great progressive company, you know, the sort of rug was being pulled back and workers were saying, no, it's not that great. Not only is it not that great, but we are going to try to organize to make it better. So the narrative in Buffalo was that the reason that the workers here found it necessary to do this was because our management was so poor already that it was the manager's fault that the workers were sort of standing up and using their voices to demand better conditions. So what they did is they took these high performing managers from other parts of the country and they stationed them all in all of the stores in Buffalo. So there was about 20 stores in the market at the time. And they said, hey, these managers are only here because we want to make your manager better. And it, we, we hope that if we make your manager better, that you won't need this union anymore. Part of it was also because they wanted to be able to surveil us every second that the store was open. So a, a, generally a manager works 40 hours a week, right? They're one person. They work an average of 40 hours a week. There are lots of operating hours in a particular store where there is no managerial presence. You know, it's a supervisor or a key holder who's running this, the shift and that's incredibly common and very normal. Well, now with each store having, you know, 
a minimum of two additional managers, there was never a moment that there wasn't managerial presence in that store. You couldn't turn around without there being a manager. You know, sometimes all three of them were there. Sometimes it was all three of them and a group of corporate, you know, and it was just constant overseeing of your job. And these are people who could never do my job. You know, they couldn't come in onto one of these floors during peak and make, you know, 50 drinks in 15 minutes. They couldn't, they couldn't accomplish that because they don't have that skill set. But all of a sudden they're there watching me, you know, and telling me how I should be doing my job. They were really there because they wanted to break up any conversations that may be being had about the unit. You know, you couldn't go into the back room to get a sleeve of cups without there being a manager, you know, six inches behind you in the off chance that you happen to have a 30 second exchange with one of the workers that was on their lunch break or something like that. So they put a lot, you know, they put a lot on these managers. As of today, there were 20, uh, approximately 20 stores in the Buffalo market when this campaign launched. They illegally closed one of them. There is, I think there is one manager left from pre-campaign. So they either forced them out or they promoted them up if they did a really good job, you know, busting the union. But no one's left standing. You know, there's one manager I think that's left standing. And these were tenured people. These were people who had been with the company for a long time. You know, I'd like to believe that some of them left because their conscience couldn't take it. And they were being asked to do things that they probably knew were illegal but they were being asked to do this to to their workers who they cared for. You know, we had relationships with these people and they were put in, you know, not a great situation. I think some of them probably did it because they were promised different bonuses and and things and like you said it's that that weird middle management position where you know, people everyone's kind of trying to survive and you know, now they're put in this kind of impossible spot where they have to make the decision to, you know, go with corporate and and abuse their workers and hopefully come out unscathed or, you know, leave and find another job. And most of them did that. Most of them left. Wow. Now, these seem like uh, I just could just pick out three blatant violations of the law. First of all, they violated the laboratory conditions thing by sending in all these people. Second of all, surveillance, surveilling. Next, they're trying to make sure and break up conversations. Then there was retaliation with, you know, firing people and closing stores. So there's four, just four off the top of my head, which seem like very blatant violations of the act. And I have to ask, because normally when big wig corporate types break the law, they get together and talk about how they can make it so they're technically not breaking the law. What, what were their excuses for these blatant violations. Well, we're not like we're not surveilling. Like you said, I guess one of them is we're here because we we're worried that your manager sucked so bad that you that you want to unionize. I mean, how are they trying to get around the law here? And and I'm wondering if the National Labor Relations Board has done or will do anything about those blatant, I mean, obvious to me violations. I have to say they didn't actually do that great of a job. I think they really um hoped and prayed that most of us wouldn't wouldn't know that our rights were being violated and wouldn't know that the laws were being broken because, you know, you have to then file an unfair labor practice on behalf of that, you know, that particular worker, or that store. And then it, you know, moves through the system. It moves to the NLRB and, and they gather their evidence and they see if something is, they can find merit to whatever that charge is. And then if they find merit, you know, they issue a complaint and then it goes up the chain. What I think what you saw in the case of Starbucks is that this is a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation. Resources, bottomless. You know, they really have as much money as you could possibly dream of, and they're making more every single second. And the penalties for most of these violations, they're, they're slim. So a lot of what you saw with Starbucks was, you know, knowingly breaking the law. And in some cases, you know, you'd you'd hear a manager say something out loud and you knew that they knew that they were breaking the law, but they were resting on the fact that it's going to take time for this charge to move its make its way through the system and to inevitably be found guilty. And and that's what they want. They and then want maybe time, just pay a small know? fine, right? Like yeah, and, delays yeah, on at, their at, side. At, you know, even if they had to pay, you know, back pay for every fired worker on this campaign, which right now is, you know, well over 200, that's nothing to a company like Starbucks. And if 
in that process, they're able to stamp out this union campaign by dragging this, you know, through the courts for as long as possible. That's inevitably what their goal would be, right? Their goal is delay, delay, delay in the hopes that you exhaust people. I mean, it's exhausting. There are lots and lots of workers who are not still standing here because who wants to live through that every single day for at this point, we're at, you know, 17 months, 18 months, 19 months. And so I I think the answer is that the, the company knew what they were doing and they didn't do a great job in a lot of cases of trying to, you know, cover it up, bail that in any way. Right. Yeah. No, they just didn't. They were just like, well, yep. Why? If you don't have to. Right. That's exactly it. If the, if the penalties are not sufficient to where it really matters all that much, it, I think it's curious in the in the instance of Starbucks, because it is this company that has it's supposed to have a better reputation. You know, we're not talking about Walmart. We're not talking, you know, we're not talking about e- even Amazon. We're not talking about companies who notoriously have, you know, bad reputations and and treat their worker are known for treating their workers badly. We're talking about a company that's supposed to do better. So for me, it was even more curious that they were so blatant about it because, you know, that's a public image and brand that I think is being severely damaged and they're doing it to themselves. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, where, you know, where's your public goodwill? And it just, it seems, it seems very odd. And the whole culture uh, between management and union just has always baffled me. I mean, I, you know, I remember when I worked for the government and I was part of the union and then I became management. And my first idea was to get the union stewards in and be like, all right, let's, do some great things together and let's work together. And, you know, I want to change these, uh, make these, you know, performance evaluation requirements easier to achieve and more quantifiable and, you know, so that everything's fair. And then my bosses were like, why are you talking to the union? Don't ever talk to the union. Don't talk to them. It's just bad news. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? These are awesome people. I was in the union. I know like, it just it's such a weird thing. And I wouldn't get on their weird management bandwagon. So I was kind of always like a black sheep in that in that regard. But, you know, I worked for the government, so it's not like they can it's not a right to work job. They can just come in and you know remove you. I mean, unless you're Donald Trump, that's a diff story for a different day. <laughs> but um, I want to ask a little bit just before I let you go and before we talk about the future and and where we are and where we're going and how people can help, I want to just ask you your top line thoughts on Schultz's testimony before Congress, what you thought of that. So I was in the room for that. It was a really surreal experience. And so the room, it's a, it was a decent size hearing room. I'd been in one of the house um, hearing rooms before, and this, this is a Senate one, and it was considerably larger. I think, I don't know how much of this made the public, but they also shipped in a whole bunch of managers and corporate in matching t-shirts to sit on like Howard's side of the room. And so that was kind of bizarre to, to see these managers, some of which had actually been the managers who had been responsible for issuing the terminations of some of the fired workers on our campaign. So to be in the room with all of you know these, I think we had 60 or so worker representatives there who were there because we'd been put, we've literally been put through 18 months of hell, but with this man at the helm, and then to see all these managers on the other side in these matching t-shirts there to support him in his actions, that was, that was hard. That was a tough pill to swallow. I think it was a a little more emotionally charged than I was even expecting, Mm -hmm. but to sit there and, and, you know, he repeatedly lied, you know, after he told the first lie, you know, Bernie sort of stopped and said, I just want to remind you, sir, that you are under oath, like just in case you forgot, you know, judging by the direction this is already going in, this is just a reminder. And he kept on repeatedly saying things like, well, these are just allegations and the company, you know, these still have to be go through the proper channels and the company has not broken the law. And we're all sitting there going, I, te- I testified for three days against this company back in July. The the judge issued that decision on March 1st and did, in fact, find the company guilty of all of these violations, at least here in Buffalo. So to continue to sit up there and repeatedly say the company has not found, been found guilty when the company had literally just been found guilty, it was just it was it was gaslighting to to like the the nth degree. And you you kind of start to feel a little crazy. And that's been the, that was the company's game from the beginning. You know, modern day union busting doesn't look like, you know, 
driving someone's car off a bridge, it looks like gaslighting and making you think you're crazy for wanting this and, you know, thinking that you deserve better. So that and the fact that when he was asked questions about bargaining and the fact that, you know, one of the union busting tactics that we didn't cover was granting things to non-union stores and withholding benefits from union stores, which is also illegal. (laughs) And, you know, right when he stepped back into power last April, he made this big announcement about all of these new benefits that the company was granting to its workers, unless you were an organized worker, and then you weren't getting any of these benefits. And when he was repeatedly asked, why did you do that? And he kept saying, well, legally, we weren't allowed to give these benefits to the organized workers. They have to be bargained over. And people were like, actually, that's not true. And you know, that's not true because I'm holding a letter where the union sent to the company that said we were waiving our right to bargain over these new benefits. We would like them, sir, please give them to us. And um, he withheld them from us. And they said, well, why did you, the only reason you would do that is if you didn't want to give the, these workers these benefits. There's no legality around this. And so to hear him repeatedly say, well, I didn't think we were allowed to do that. Sir, you're paying a million dollar union busting attorneys. God knows how much money daily. I'm certain that if you were you were you didn't know, you could have just asked someone and they would have been like, yeah, legally you can give these benefits to the workers, especially since most of those benefits were based on the union's proposals. You know, they took things that we had put forward as asked and they were like, you're right, that is a great idea. We're going to give them to all the non-organized workers and we're going to tell the organized workers that, you know, they they don't get those. And that's why I don't get the whole thing. I, I just don't. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's not going to cost them that. It's going to cost them more money to fight this in court than it would to just give all these benefits to everybody and work with the union. It makes absolutely no sense. Why do you think it is that they're willing to spend all this money five times as much money as it costs to just give the benefits to everybody to not have a union. What What is the impetus behind that? It's a power struggle. I mean, we've said from day one that you we're fighting Howard Schultz as ego. You know, this is his life's work and nobody likes being told that your life's work isn't as good as you think it is. And so, and that's the reality. The reality is that this company is not the company it was five years ago. It's not the company it was 10 years ago. I mean, I we lived... We saw what this company did to its workers during the pandemic. We saw, you know, one of the hardest reckonings I had to come to was that Starbucks realized how profitable this pandemic could be for them. And it was because we stayed open the entire time and we sort of, we offered this little tiny bit of normalcy in a world that was upside down. You could still go down the street to your local Starbucks and get your caramel macchiato and feel like some, you know, sometime soon things were going to get back to normal. And the company realized this and they were like, man, we we're going to make some money. And so they stayed open the entire time, which meant we were there customer facing, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, putting our our safety at risk, putting our family safety at risk. And we've got the CEO at this point, it was Kevin Johnson, and he's on all these financial shows. And he's bragging about these record breaking profits that the company is bringing in during this pandemic. And I'm watching my coworkers crying in the back room of my store because they don't know if working 40 hours a week for this multi-billion dollar corporation, if they're going to be able to pay their rent and put groceries in their fridge. And that that's who this company, that is what this company became. That is why we are fighting for things because you're right. There, If there was ever a company on the planet that could do better by its workers, this is it. This is the company that can afford to do it. And so the fact that we're still here fighting so hard it's just baffling to me that you have a company that could could easily be the hero and is choosing to be the villain. And I think that goes back to power. Yeah. And ego and narcissism. Right. You have to be able to acknowledge there's a problem uh, before you can correct it. And, and you know, we saw that with certain political leaders. We see that with certain Twitter owners. Now we see it with, you know, and, and, and these, you know, major uh, corporate CEOs. Because if I'm the CEO, I'd be like, look, this is a massive friggin' company. I can't control everything that goes on. Let's partner with the union so that we are sure that everything is good and going well. It would be cheaper for me to do that than to hire union than to union bust. It wouldn't be illegal. And we would look great to everyone. And it's like a win, 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 win. I don't I it just completely baffles my mind that they won't allow themselves to say, I can't do this all by myself. I need some help and unions are the way. 
it it helps the bottom line. It helps the workers. It helps the business. You, they would make more money, honestly. I, I don't know. It just it's, mm-hmm. it's mind boggling. So w- what's next and how can people help? So I think, you know, thankfully, the, one of the great things that did come out of Howard's testimony was people have really started paying attention. You know, this was kind of a, a movement and a campaign that got a lot of attention at the very beginning because it was kind of shocking to see a a coffee chain try to unionize, especially one, you know, as globally known as Starbucks, especially one as, you know, supposedly so great that why would its workers need to unionize? But now we're 19 months in. And so people, people are like, what do you mean this is still happening? Or what do you mean you still don't have a contract? You know, my store won December of 2021 and it's, April of 2023, and we still don't have a contract. So his testimony, because he really didn't come off great, I'll just, you know, put it nicely, got people to start really paying attention. So we've got a lot of people on the political side that are paying attention. We've got a lot of, you know, the public who isn't kind of dialed in now. And it's, it's at this point, it's about putting as much pressure on the company and just calling them out on all of this BS publicly to say, listen, we're standing with the workers and we want you to get to the table and start negotiating a fair contract. So that's, I think, the most important thing is to keep the spotlight on the company so that they don't, you know, maybe they're less likely to try to get away with some of this awful, you know, stuff they've been engaging in. At heart, they still want to be that company or they still profess to be that that progressive company that is better. So if we can continue to say, okay, well, put your money where your mouth is, you know, we want you to be that company too. So stop doing all of this stuff. So I think what we're saying is, you know, draw attention to it. Um, On a very, very, very micro level, if you are near a Starbucks store that you know is either organized or is trying to organize, going in and continuing to show that support and solidarity to those workers, part of the retaliation has been significant hours cuts so that, you know, some of these workers went from working 30 hours a week to being scheduled 12 hours a week and then are expected to you know, somehow make that work and be able to to pay their bills. And when they say, okay, well, I have to go get another job to supplement my income, they're told, well, you can't reduce your availability. If you reduce your availability, you're going to get less than 12 hours a week. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely absurd. So, you know, please, if you can support those workers, you know, vocally, you know, an extra couple of dollars in the tip jar, anything along those lines, just to let them know that, you know, you're aware that they're fighting still and that you're standing with them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today, because I think it's voices like yours that make workers understand that they aren't alone and that they aren't crazy. That is how we combat the gaslighting, right, is by speaking out and telling our stories. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, I do appreciate your time today. Best of luck in the future. I'd like to touch base again with you to see how, see where things are. And uh, I, I really do wish you the best. Thanks so much, Michelle Eisen. Thank you. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Good news, everyone. Good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, a shout out to somebody you love, pod pet picks. If you don't have a pet, you can send an adoptable pet in your area. A shout out to a local business. If you want to play what the mutt, if you want to show me tape squares on your floor that cats either sit in or avoid like the plague, or maybe your husband or your wife or partner or pets or of dogs or somebody, maybe a guinea pig in the square, whatever. Let's see. Center square, right? Remember Hollywood squares? Let's play. Anything you want to send. Send it to dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Again, I want to wish Dana a happy birthday. I miss you, my friend. I wish you were here to read this good news with me, but she will be back soon. She will be back in a few short days, which I'm very excited about. First up from Bunny, pronouns she, they. I was in bed struggling to get up for a doctor's appointment when my nesting partner presented his phone, playing your voice, reading my words. I am still crying happy tears. None of my writings have ever been read publicly before. I'm overjoyed you were the first to do it. After testifying against a horrific criminal in a high-profile federal case a year ago, I felt like my only voice was used up in that courtroom to carry out my civic duty, but I'm learning to claim my life and my voice. Our fur princes are boys. I thought so. Sending more pet tax 
and a Justin Pearson poem, along with my deepest gratitude for how you use your voices to support democracy and brighten some very dark days for so many. Bunny, thank you. Look at this baby with the giant head. Look at him. H-I-M-B. Oh, and the little kitten. Ginger baby. I love boy cats. And then I read the just, oh, Justin Pearson. Ah, different poem. Just how does one represent while re- repeatedly silenced under a, under a speaker who prefers to lord over and expel dissidents, stripped of due process? This representative of his constituents in the paltry minutes rationed to him never ceased to use his voice for those whose chants were ignored outside. Justice is not just if prejudiced. Peaceful protests must be heard, even when inconveniences tidy structures of power. All voices deserve dignity. Rules must apply to everyone equally, so that even the Last, the lost and the least of us are represented. Only fools expel a man imploring for justice. No expulsion will erode such passion. Ah, wonderful. Thank you again, Bunny. Appreciate you. Love your kitties. And thanks for all you do. Next up, John from Jersey, pronouns he and him. May I suggest the bean pun as a thing? My stoner cousin refrains from smoking weed on election day, so he'll have a clear head and remember to vote for the Democrat. So I informed him, successfully re-elected rep, that dopelessly he voted for you. Drum roll. Sorry. <laughs> but um, tss, right? Thank you very much, John. And, you know, they're taking away our blue checks on 420. So there we go. Uh, self-care share from Cindy, pronouns she and her. Hello, and thank you so much for every bean of the beans. I wish I could join you all in D.C., but I'll be on my way to Ireland. So hopefully there will be another opportunity for some other meet and greet. My de-stress tools are my camera and the Seek app by iNaturalist. I photograph and identify every living thing around me, bugs, amphibians, birds, plants, fungi, flowers. I love knowing the names of all the different wildflowers, what kind of spider that is, or whether that orgy is composed by frogs or toads. (laughs) Every day, about 20 minutes before sunset, I go outside and take pictures of the beauty around me and post them on Facebook. They make me feel better, more connected with the good things around me. And I'm told by my Facebook friends and friends of friends that they enjoy them too. Another healing part of my day is the walk with my 14-year-old Australian shepherd, Maeve. FYI, I, Maeve rhymes with Dave. I'm very lucky to live on a seven-acre piece of land on two very steep hills for which my husband and I cut switchback trails. Maeve and Greg and I walk down the winding trail about half a mile to where the trail meets the nearest dirt road, and then walk back to the house, passing by two neighbors that have horses and cows. Moo. I bring carrots with me every day and feed the horses and get lots of pets and hugs and kisses. We have eight formerly feral cats, all spayed and neutered, and some of them walk with us. Frequently, the neighbors' formerly ferals will join us daily, like a daily mini parade. In addition to carrots, I also carry a sandwich back full of cubed baked chicken, great treats for Maeve, and any peckish cats who decide to join us. Okay, for pet tax, here's some pics of last night's walks of some of the critters I'm lucky to be able to adore. Maeve trotting past the fiddle necks, and the tuxedo's name is Ishtar, and the void in the grass nest is Anubis. Oh, uh, I have, uh, I had a red merle. It's so beautiful. What a beautiful baby. Oh, tuxedo and void. I love them. A beautiful area. How peaceful. Thank you for that self-care share. Ah, I feel I feel more at peace just having read it. So thank you. Next up from Adam, pronouns he and him. Hey, AG, you asked for submissions about what we're doing to get by. So here you go. I'm a former physics teacher. Cool. Who needed to leave the classroom to take care of my mental health. Totally understandable. I've taken to photography to try to continue to flex the creative itch and express myself outside the classroom. I did just get a job at a hardware store to keep me and my wife going financially. I don't know what my photography style is exactly, but I've included two pictures that capture it pretty well. The diner photo was taken from the corner booth of a locally famous diner called the Steer Inn, taken with an iPhone. The dandelion bee photo was taken with a cheap digital camera and a zoom lens. I took hundreds of photos of that cute little bee that day. For pet tax, I've included me and my wife's boys, Brad and Opie. Brad is five, the chonker with the black coloration, and Opie, 14, the orange boy. The two of them mostly get along until Brad decides he wants to play and Opie never does. 
Thank you for what you do. I've recently gotten out of the psychiatric hospital and your show is a welcome, steady thing to have each day. Adam, welcome back. Look at these beautiful babies. One of them is mid-yawn. So cute. Oh, very cool pictures. I love the comp- the composition of the diner the diner photo. I really do. It's got a it's got a genre, right? Like a mood. Very cool. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Maggie from Pennsylvania, pronouns she and her. Hi, I've been listening to Daily Beans from Barcelona for the past week, usually with a cappuccino or Aperol spritzer. Beans is just the right amount of updates each day to keep me tethered to the news. Catalonia and Spain has been delightful. They even put my legs up to my shins in the Mediterranean Sea. Flying home to the USA tomorrow. I miss my rescue pup, Micah. Woof, woof. Oh, look how beautiful. Mediterranean Sea. There it is. Ah, and next up from Dan, pronouns he and him, bat boy testimony correction, citizens of Beantopia. Stephen Miller was only questioned for six hours because they started at midnight. (laughs) They had to stop at dawn. He was afraid he would burst into flames in direct sunlight when leaving the courthouse. Seriously, fuck that fascist golem motherfucker. (laughs) Thank you, Dan. (laughs) And from Anonymous, I have a name for your cat, cats in tape boxes submissions masturbating. Oh, I like it. The act of luring cats into masking tape boxes. Not too shabby. Thank you everyone for your submissions. Uh, I appreciate this. Thanks for the pet pics and all the good news. And those self-care posts are good. Keep them coming. Let us know what you do to keep grounded. I love the photography. We had a couple of photography submissions today and walks in nature. Are so wonderful. You know, if you listen to this podcast and you, while you're walking or on the treadmill, you know, you'll burn like, oh, uh, probably 200 calories. That's like three glasses of wine, you guys. Just so you know, just in case you want to walk while you listen to this out in nature. Um, Might be a cool thing to do. Just a simple habit to pick up. Anyway, thank you so much for all your submissions. If you have any, again, send it to us at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. Once again, happy birthday to Dana. I'll be back tomorrow in your ears for the Friday show. And then we have, of course, a Patreon happy hour via Zoom where you can ask me anything. And that starts at 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, the next one will be live in Washington, D.C. Trying to decide if I want to do like a fancy actual catered event or if we should just meet up um, somewhere somewhere nearby and try to crash with a big old table. Uh, We'll see. Anyway, thanks so much. Until tomorrow, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for the Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. This spring, transform your outdoor space into a regular gathering place for you and your loved ones with help from Ashley. Whether you're into wicker, teak, or driftwood-inspired furniture, we've got the look you're going for. Add in accessories like string lights and beverage tubs to take your patio party from basic to curated and enjoy cozy evening vibes with a new fire pit. Visit ashley.com or stop by your local store and find affordable pricing and expert support today. Shop and save today, only at Ashley.